with that said, everybody should be able to say I got it on, on the, the call. Um, I'm going to go to John. John, if you're happy to give us maybe 10 or 12 minutes on where you think we're at on the issue of uh, peace and neutrality in this country. Sure. Well, thank you very much, Nasa. And uh, thanks to uh, Janet Horner for the invitation and to the Just Transition Greens for inviting me along this evening. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm using my iPhone, whatever, for whatever reason, the webcam wasn't working. So I hope you can hear me OK. Um, I, uh, I'm not going to give a, f a philosophical talk on the whole question of neutrality. Um, others are better qualified to do that. But uh, you're right. Um, NASA. My, my background really over the years has been as a foreign affairs spokesperson within the Green Party for many years. And um, I, I have been quite outspoken on those issues. I mean, I, I have been on delegations uh, abroad along with Michael D. Higgins and others. We went to Palestine, we went to Iraq, um, which is quite a harrowing experience, I have to say. And I was very I was, I was very pleased indeed that Michael D um, decided to speak out on this issue uh, because it alerted the public to a serious, serious issue. And in fact, um, you know, when you look then at the polls, you can see very clearly that um, the majority of people in this country are still wedded to the idea and like the idea of uh, Irish neutrality because we have a very good record in relation to blue helmet um, missions. Now, the thing is that um, I have not been involved in frontline politics for quite some time. Um, I do attend my local group occasionally. And so I wasn't clued into what was happening internally in the party. And um, it was only by pure chance that I found out that there was a, a new policy in the offing. Um, and um, I was in touch with um, Vincent P. Martin, who is the um, senator the spokesperson on this issue. And he casually mentioned to me that there was a new policy and that there was an op-ed going to go into the Irish Times. And I said, well, that's interesting. Could I could I have a read of the op-ed? You know, and uh, well, I did have a read of it. And, uh, you know, I was just astounded, you know, um, you know, there's there's, a, there's an Irish phrase, hit my ass, my hassle. you know, I almost fell out of my standing when I read it uh, because, you know, the crux, it, you know, the central issue um, of this new policy was to get rid of the triple lock. Um, and, you know, I was instrumental in getting the triple lock in the very first place because I, I uh, you know, I campaigned on the Nice Treaty, and if I may say so, campaigned fairly well. I engaged in a lot of debates, and we won those debates. And so, therefore, to get the Nice Treaty through, the government put forward this idea uh, of the triple lock. And for those of you who don't know what the triple lock is, is very simply that before um, you know our uh, troops can go abroad, they require um, a number of things. First of all. Uh, the say so of the government, say so of the doll, and then a UN mandate, and um, that was really that became you know the policy. Then, I mean, look, we can talk at length here uh, this evening about about uh, the whole question of um, neutrality. It, it it means different things, and what we have in this country essentially is an Irish solution for an Irish problem. I mean, the, Brian Lenehan Sr. once said, look, we know we're neutral, but we also know which side we're on. Um, so we, we, we've, we're kind of making it up as we go along. And it has always been like that. And if you go right back to um, the debates between, say, and the, the approach between Frank Aiken of Fianna Fáil and, um, say, Lamas, Lamas was far more flexible. Aiken wanted this policy uh, of non-alignment. And... Um, you know, there's no question that, and I'm looking at, uh, you know, the um, what what was in the policy, and maybe it would be helpful for people if I if I read out what was in the original policy, because immediately uh, I was in touch with uh, leading figures in the party, communicating my disquiet. You know, um, I, I said, look, this is uh, this is such a departure from where we were at. 
um, I don't think you should publish this policy. Now, I mean, rightly so. They said, well, you're coming very late to the to the show. We've been sort of two years at this and you, you know, where were you? Well, I didn't know about it, frankly. I just didn't know anything about this. Uh, and uh, it is true that there was a, uh, a group convened by Garrett Kelly. They had done um, a lot of exhaustive work, apparently, and come to these conclusions. But what really stood out for me when I read it was this idea, not only were they getting rid of the triple lock for peacekeeping, but when you read through it, and I, and I suspect, and I did talk to people afterwards, they didn't fully understand the implications of the wording, right? And uh, maybe it might be helpful now if I, if I read what the original wording was, because it said, with a view to clarifying the legal mechanism and enhancing the state's independence and latitude in the deployment of Irish defence personnel abroad, the party supports an amendment of the double lock, as they describe it, in the Amended Defence Act to allow Irish troops to be deployed overseas on multilateral missions, providing that the proposed deployment is A, is approved by Dáil Éireann, B, has been reviewed by, the, by Shannon Éireann, and C, is either supported by a UN Security Council or General Assembly resolution, or failing such a resolution by a decision of a regional organisation and or regional arrangements encouraged under and consistent with the United Nations Charter and the purposes and principles of the United Nations. Now, most people when reading that will think, God, well, that's that's okay, like because it's it's consistent with this, the United Nations Charter and the purposes and principles of the United Nations. Um, the problem is um, that for years and years I've be, I've come across this particular wording, and um, you know NATO actually they say that they are consistent with the principles of the United Nations. So and NATO is a regional organisation. So therefore, had we accepted that wording, um, we um, could have been off on missions um, and um, the fact is that peacekeeping you know is one thing peace enforcement is well the first Gulf, Gulf War was peace enforcement and so yeah my, the alarm bells went off for me immediately uh, and I said that wording is far too vague now I'm not happy I have to say with the fact that we're ditching uh, the triple lock in relation to peacekeeping and watering it down considerably. Uh, but in terms of peace enforcement, that was a red line for me. And so in order for, for me to change this, uh, there was only one procedure left, and that was to get onto the executive of the party and ask them to delay publication until there had been an amendment. Now the prid quo quo for that is that, well, look, you can't change the entire policy. Can you just make one small change? So. That's what it was left up to. I had to make one small change to the party, uh, to the to the policy. And um, so I changed the following and I said, and this is in the current policy, that uh, it's uh, is a is approved by Dáil Éireann, has been reviewed by the Sh by Shannon Éireann. I said that because that's what the group had agreed. And I think Vincent, because he's a senator, wanted to put that in. And C is either supported by a UN Security Council or General, uh, General Assembly resolution or failing such a resolution by a decision of a regional organization or regional arrangements. And this is the key, authorized under chapter eight of the UN Charter as set out specifically in articles 52, 53 and 54. Now, when you read those articles, it makes it very clear that the regional groupings can only act in terms of peace enforcement if, um, you know, they have the UN mandate. So what that means is that as far as the Green Party is concerned, uh, when it comes to peace enforcement, uh, we have to have a UN mandate. So um, I think that's progress, but I mean, uh, we were fortunate um, that we put that in. And indeed when Eamon spoke at the forum, and uh, I wasn't there, but I believe he spoke very well, he actually mentioned that um, specifically those articles, and I'm very pleased about that. Um, but, you know, we are going to face uh, into, I think, now I could be wrong, and I hope I'm wrong about this, um, I think there will be legislation proposed. I, I, there's just too many things aligning at the moment for me. The very fact that we have this forum, and um, I think when all is said and done, 
this forum will recommend one thing. It's not going to recommend that we join NATO or we have a mutual defense clause. What is it going to recommend? It's going to recommend that we ditch the triple lock. That's it. That's the game. And uh, I think then I would suspect that there are some mandarins in the Department of Defense who probably have um, an amendment drafted already. You must remember when we, when the Defense Acts were amended back in 2006, uh, it went through in two and a half hours in an afternoon. Uh, and uh, now I think there would be more vigilance this time. I think the opposition will be looking out for this, but we in the Green Party have to be vigilant as well. And we have to push back if there is an attempt by Fine Gael, and you must remember Fine Gael for a very long time, they have been advocates of joining NATO. That's fine, that's their policy. I accept that. But we are, uh, we're a different party. We're the Green Party, we have a different approach. And I would like um, to see us, you know, uh, go out there and, and, and actually be proactive in the cause of peace. Um, one of the key arguments used, and I'll finish, I don't know what my time is, NASA, but um, I hope, um, how am I doing? You're a little over, but it, this is fascinating. Yeah, okay, well, look, let, me just, let, let me just conclude on this. You know, I, I've heard this argument used over and over again. Oh my God, you know, uh, the UN is not fit for purpose. Um, how can we allow the Russians to veto our foreign policy? Fact is that in 70 years of peacekeeping, the Russians haven't vetoed a single mission, not, on a, not a single occasion. The Chinese uh, on one occasion, because of uh, in North Macedonia, because of, uh, of Taiwan. But when, when the people say that, you know, the UN is not fit for purpose, uh, that worries me. And I don't think we should allow that sort of argument because it reminds me of what happened in the, in the 1920s, 1930s, when the League of Nations collapsed. You know, the Americans never joined. Then they, one by one, the Axis powers left. And we know what happened. So multilateralism um, was really, it was resurrected in 1945. Why? Because we now had a situation where we could have a conflagration. We could have uh, where people were in possession of atomic weapons. They still are. People forget that. And so in order to avoid a nuclear conflict, they said, wait, we'll, we'll stitch in a veto here. Right. That's why it was done. And I know that the UN can be extremely frustrating. I know very well. I was in Copenhagen in 2009 when the climate talks collapsed. But um, if you ditch multilateralism, where do you go? You know, where do you go? And we should be advocates of the multilateral approach. We should be saying, listen, this war in Ukraine is just devastating. You know, there are young Ukrainian people, uh, men mostly dying in the trenches around Bakhmut. Uh, young Russians, it's a senseless loss of life. And we know ourselves from our own peace process how complex this can be. And so we should be saying, guys, you know, get the UN in there. Let's try and do something and get peace. Uh, instead of this warmongering and saying, oh, we're going to keep supplying weapons and weapons, weapons until Ukraine wins. Well, you know, I don't think that's going to happen. I think we're going to get this bloody stalemate, which will go on for years and years. Um, you might ask, why am I raising Ukraine? Well, you know, it's it's the reason that they're raising the whole question of Russia right now is because of the war in Ukraine. That's why we had um, Finland joining NATO. That's why we had Sweden. Uh, and, you know, to me, saying that Russia is this massive threat. Well, Russia, when the Soviet Union was there, was a far bigger threat. You know, they went into East Germany in 1953. They went to Hungary in 56. Um, we had the Prague Spring in 68. Um, I remember myself being in, in Germany in, in 1983 when the Pershing, Pershing II rockets were being, uh, were being put up there uh, under Ronald Reagan. I mean, we really thought we were going to have uh, a world war there and then. So the threat was far bigger, in, in my view, back then when the, when the Soviet Union uh, reign supreme. Uh, so I hope that we can have a good debate this evening. Uh, I'm happy to take questions and thank you once again for inviting me. Thank you, John. Um, okay, Paul, I might come to you. 
Um, John has thrown up a whole load of, of issues there. Um, I don't know what you want to focus on or if you want to kind of give an overview, but I'm going to hand over to you now for 10, 12 minutes. Perfect. Thanks so much, Nasa. And, and thanks so much uh, for inviting me to, to speak today. I really appreciate it. I think this is a really important conversation that we're having around this in Ireland at the moment. Um, <clears throat> and maybe just um, for those of you who don't know, uh, Christian Aid is an international NGO with a turnover of about 100 million a year that's headquartered in the UK and Ireland. And more than 70% of the countries that we work in are now classified as fragile or conflict affected. And that's an increase from only 29% back in 2020. So a lot of our work will focus on you know, tackling violence and building peace. And that's the work that I lead for us. Um, and between 2021 and 2022, that would have reached about 1.27 million people directly and about 30 million people indirectly. And the reason I'm bringing that up is because, you know, we work to protect and defend fundamental rights to make uh, to ensure that people are safe, secure and more resilient. And I think that that's a really key part of this conversation. And at Christian Aid, I think that we are particularly concerned by the the kind of unpredictability of state responses to conflict and insecurity and the kind of growing trend that we see internationally around you know investing heavily in military solutions that have very often led to kind of human rights violations um, rather than addressing the kind of root causes of conflict and you know when we look globally we see that now and um, there are more violent conflicts globally than at any time in the past 30 years and by mid 2022, so around now, we expect that there's around 100 million people who've been forcibly displaced from their homes because of violence and protracted conflict. And um, so we see that this is driving massive humanitarian needs and that these kind of security focused approaches are not necessarily having the impact that's anticipated from them. Um, and this is something that we've seen as a trend far before um, the, the conflict in Ukraine. Um, in 2021, before you know um, the invasion uh, of Ukraine, we saw that military expenditure had uh, exceeded two trillion that year for the very first time. Um, and since then it's increased to 2.2 trillion um, and you know is anticipated to continue both driven by Ukraine, but also a, a rising kind of militarization that we see globally and within the EU. And this really highlights a very kind of top-down security-led approach um, that addresses um, you know, conflict and social crises and you know, tackling violence with violence that doesn't necessarily work. And you know, we see this um, at a time when the World Bank has asked countries to think and pivot more towards prevention. But we've seen that countries across the whole OECD, for example, have contributed only 12% of their ODA towards peace building or conflict prevention. And that represents less than 1% of the economic losses from conflict and significantly pales in comparison to the level of expenditure that there is in military. Um, and so for Christian Aid, we use like lots of different strategies and approaches to help um, address peace, including in the onset of extreme violence and war, um, whether that's humanitarian response or whether it is around a more kind of um, involved peace process or you know, community responses to address violence. Um, and I think this is really consistent with the kind of approach that Ireland has set out in a better world and the kind of government policy document that drives our international development and really positions Ireland as a very progressive voice on peace and human rights globally. Um, and so we, I guess, would urge political leaders to resist this kind of tide of militarization and to invest in the long, hard and very necessary work that is diplomacy, peace, development and disarmament, the key niche that Ireland has already successfully skilled skillfully carved out for ourselves on the international stage and ultimately, you know, led to us being elected to the UN Security Council quite recently. Um, and that means that we can, you know, adapting to security environments means, you know, we can still adapt and shift, but that has to be done without losing our DNA, our values, or the sense of what makes us us or what makes us Irish in this case. And, you know, I think um, that maybe the niche that Ireland has looked at um, internationally, I don't think is something that was reflected within the security forum very well. Um, I think that maybe um, 
what our reputation is internationally was something that didn't really feed into this discussion. And it was more focused around, you know, the need to alter neutrality or the triple lock um, in the changing kind of security um, face that we see during Ukraine. But we also have to remember that this is not the first time war has come to Europe. Uh, if we look at the Yugoslav wars in the 90s um, and the, when we see the kind of legacy of the primacy of Irish neutrality throughout all of these crises in Europe over the years, it begs the question of why now? Why is this such a key thing to uh, shift after 100 years of independence and, and this being so um, pivotal within our foreign policy? And we see this in the 90s where the white paper on foreign policy talked about our neutrality as providing the basis for Ireland's wider efforts to promote international peace and security and has informed every aspect of our foreign policy. And the benefits of this have you know, been very large in terms of you know, um, what we've achieved globally. And I'll go into that in a little bit more later. But I think, you know, um, it's also given us this sense of um, a different type of power and uh, not hard military power or economic power, but um, as real, you know, diplomats using our leverage and skillfully kind of uh, as a bridge maker um, to support peace and to support processes that have allowed us to um, punch above our weight on an international stage. And I think, um, you know, when we see that uh, there's headlines uh, in recent weeks that it's time for Ireland to grow up and abandon neutrality, I think that that really fails to grasp the role that Ireland has played in our history as a central tenant of foreign policy and also, you know, potentially our sense of Irishness. And, you know, obviously it's linked to my sense of Irishness. And um, I guess that's a difficult thing to measure at a country level. But, um, you know, it's also something that's very well understood within the EU and, you know, there are, it's codified within the protocol attached to the Lisbon Treaty. So there is, you know, a real sense that, you know, if we look at the motto of the EU, that we are united in diversity, that means diversity of cultures, policies, politics, many different things, and there's space for a neutral country within, within Europe moving forward. And um, when we look at kind of the consistency in our policies, I think the, the fact that we campaigned for the UN Security Council on pillars of empathy, partnership and independence, crucially independence, um, as natural bridge builders, I think that that really shows um, how our neutrality has been a core tenant, how we've outwardly looked globally. Um, and maybe if we talk about like the history of neutrality in Ireland, just very quickly, um, you know, in June 1940, Ireland actually uh, refused an offer of unification from Churchill um, uh, if we would join the Allies. Uh, and we also faced an economic blockade from the UK at that time and pressure from the US president around our neutrality, which was maintained throughout World War II. Um, and also in terms of, you know, Irish independence and sovereignty, it's always been intrinsically linked to kind of military neutrality. And although, you know, it's not explicit, I think the spirit and intendment is somewhat captured within the Irish constitution under Article 29 that talks about, you know, the ideal of peace and friendly cooperation, the adherence to, you know, settlement of international disputes and arbitration and things like that. But, um, you know, I think, when we talk about neutrality, it's also, you know, important that we have to talk about what this incremental creep or drift, as the president referred to it, towards militarization ha has looked like. And, you know, um, it was mentioned already in terms of Fine Gael, but the policy paper in, in 2018 advocated for the development of a European defense union and also, um, you know, um, talked about, you know, how it needed to adhere to a policy of non-military alignment um, like we have now, but it also talked about how we maybe needed to shift from this idea of neutrality towards an independent non-nuclear defense. Now, given that we're already signed up to all of the nuclear weapons treaties, that would leave a pretty low watermark in, in my view. Um, and then, you know, when we look at, um, you know, more recently in terms of like the EU's militarization, I think that that's where it gets particularly alarming. Because I don't think this debate about neutrality should actually focus around NATO or joining NATO, but actually the shift in, in the EU towards a more militarized union. 
and we've seen that there has been, you know, a greater kind of a move towards this in statements that we've seen from the president of the European Commission back in 2017, who talked about the need for a fully fledged European Defence Union by 2025. Um, in 2018, President Macron talked about a true European army. And in 2019, uh, Chancellor Merkel talked about the creation of a European army. So what we're seeing is that there is political momentum within EU member states towards that. And that doesn't mean that Ireland would get left behind because the creation of any kind of army would still need to have this kind of institutional arrangements or treaty requirements and changes. Um, but it does represent that there has been a drift towards um, you know, an increasingly um, militarized EU project, if you like. And we've seen, you know, I, I hope I'm not running too far over on time. No, you're um, not too bad. You might finish it up soon though. <laughs> perfect. Um, and we've seen, you know, there's been, you know, PESCO, the European Defence Fund, the unfortunately named European Peace Facility, have all been developed in order to provide arms and, you know, to uh, expand in terms of, um, EU's um, military sovereignty, if you like. Um, and that raises real concerns around how we fit in within the EU project moving forward. While we've been contributing towards PESCO and towards the EU peace facility, that's been done without kind of funding weapons of lethal force. Um, and then maybe I'll just talk about a little bit around how this is also around, you know, foreign policy consistency and an issue of trust from the public. If we look at the program for government, our shared future for the current government that was negotiated obviously by the Greens, by Fine Gael and Fianna Fáil, uh, it talks about how we will ensure that overseas operations will be conducted in line with our policy of military neutrality, the PESCO that we will only be involved in where it doesn't compromise our active military neutrality, or the peace facility, um, you know, if it doesn't fund weapons of lethal force. So they're really key tenants um, of our current government. And I think that although nothing's ever static, it's really important that we have these discussions. Um, there's loads more that we can say, and I think it's good that we can have an active discussion in this space, but maybe just the last thing I mentioned is around the forum itself. And maybe, you know, there was a gap, I think, in somewhat in terms of an almost confirmation bias around shifting the triple lock or our policy of military neutrality. And I think when we look at the countries that were involved in the sessions around learning from our neighbors, there was one very noticeable absence. Austria was not there. Austria is an EU member state that remains neutral despite you know, what's happening in Ukraine and is aligned with us on nuclear weapons treaties who weren't there. And I think that that's a really telling kind of point, particularly considering considering the Thonish has said that we've chosen the countries that did participate uh, quite deliberately. And I think, you know, um, it's very important that we have these kind of discussions. Ireland has evolved and citizens' assemblies have allowed us to tackle really challenging issues over the last number of years. And I think that if this is um, a conversation that needs to continue, then a citizens' assembly is really the space for that to take place and for us to deal with this in a really more detailed and balanced way. Thank you so much, Paul. That's brilliant. Um, now, I give people a minute to consider their questions. Paul has actually <laughs> covered some of my questions. I wanted to ask about PESCO. Um, but uh, I, I noticed that Kieran Koff MEP is on the call, and I might just give you an opportunity, Kieran, if you wanted to come in for a couple of minutes. He wasn't on the bill, but it's an added extra. Hi, Kieran. Hi, good afternoon to you all, and our good evening to you all, and greetings from, uh, from Brussels. Thanks, Nasa, for. for uh, uh, bringing me in, I'll speak just for about three minutes, if that's okay. Um, and maybe really, I think the purpose of contributing is to speak as well as an MEP, but as the uh, as the European Affairs spokesperson for uh, the party. I want to say that within Brussels or within the Brussels bubble, um, the invasion of Ukraine has changed things quite dramatically. Uh, in the same way that COVID changed a lot of what we uh, do uh, in, in, in Brussels. Um, it means that the mood amongst the MEPs is very strongly in favour of supporting Ukraine and Russia's murderous invasion of a European country is, deeply, is deeply concerning. 
uh, and it has dramatically changed the narrative within the European Union. And for ourselves uh, and for the member states, uh, for Austria and for Malta, who are also neutral, um, we are in a sense in a corner arguing for neutrality um, in a room with two dozen other member states of the European Union uh, arguing very strongly for action. But also we are seeing changes within the green parties of Europe. Uh, we're seeing our colleagues in both Sweden and Finland strongly in favor of their countries joining NATO. Uh, I think particularly in the case of Finland, they have a, a border that's 1400 kilometers long, I think, uh, with Russia, and they are afraid. They are deeply concerned. Uh, I know, uh, John, you said that um, uh, the Soviet Union was more threatening than Russia. But I think Putin is very threatening. I think uh, Russia under Putin is very, very dangerous. Uh, I was in Lithuania last month and uh, where the big NATO summit has been on. And in the way that you've like big signs in Amsterdam saying, I love, love Amsterdam. In, in Lithuania, they had a big sign in Lithuania saying, we are NATO. And the discussion in Lithuania is, well, what can we do within the first 24 hours after Russia invades? Who will provide 1,000 troops, 2,000 troops? How will we resist for that first week? That kind of debate is very alien to us in Ireland, but it is a debate that is certainly very visible the closer you get to the European border uh, with Russia. And I think it's important that you know that. I take the point that John made that Russia has not vetoed a single uh, UN mission, but I would strongly argue that the presence of Russia has stopped the proposals for various UN peacekeeping missions over the years. Um, so uh, I, 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 while there hasn't been a veto, I, I do think it has a huge influence over, a uh, stultifying influence over, uh, over uh, the UN. Um, meanwhile, within the European Union, we're seeing legislation, the ASAP Act, which is an act in support of ammunition uh, production, uh, where within the Greens we're, we're abstaining on that, but it is a strong push to provide ammunition uh, to Ukraine. And there are many similar pieces of legislation, and we're seeing funds taken out from other projects and being put into supporting uh, Ukraine. So. I think it's important to be, to be aware of this. Uh, Grace and I carefully consider any legislation that comes forward. Uh, we generally abstain or vote against parts of the details of legislation, but the concerns around Ukraine will continue um, over the years to come. It is deeply worrying uh, to see the invasion of a sovereign country. Uh, I take the point that many people will continue to die, but there have been attempts to get the United Nations involved. Uh, but the mood in Brussels is, look, we have to defend Ukraine uh, because um, our country has been invaded. And I think the comparison uh, to the Irish state isn't a bad one. Look, if, if, if troops came into Loud uh, or to, to Cavan, uh, would we simply look for a UN solution or would we resist? Uh, and I think. Um, you know, I was talking to a woman from Ukraine earlier this evening. Um, they strongly wish to continue the defense of their country. Sadly, that means that people will continue to die. Um, but uh, there is strong support for Ukraine that I think will uh, continue. One last thing I'd say, I do think Ireland is in a fantastic position of being neutral. I think it allows us to act as uh, peacekeepers or indeed peacemakers within, within the realm of diplomacy. And I think it's hugely important that we continue to do so and that we resist any move uh, from Fine Gael or others to kind of push us towards joining NATO. And one last word just on the PESCO tasks. I've looked in detail at the 50-55 PESCO tasks. I do think we need to cooperate with other countries uh, to prepare for cybersecurity threats and to protect our waters. I think if that means engaging in PESCO tasks, I'm happy to do that, but I think we should choose carefully from a list of about 55 tasks. They're certainly not all about ammunition. There are many different aspects of cooperation that I think 
are worth doing. And I'll leave it there. Thank you, NASA, for allowing me in. And I'm sorry I have to leave you at this point. Thanks, Kieran. Um, so I see that there is a couple of questions in the chat and then there's a couple of um, questioners. I just remind people again, if you ask the question yourself, you will be on the recording. Um, so I might go between the two. So I'll start with Janet, then go to a chat and then come to you, Oliver. And um, Paul and John, if you want to speak to anything that Kieran raised there, please do when we, we come back. So Janet. Yeah, thanks a million. Um, and thanks to both the speakers. I think that's really interesting and certainly provides a different perspective than what I got out of two days of sitting through a, a forum on security, which I would say was left a lot of topics off the table um, in that case, including very strongly, I think, the issue of um, humanitarianism and how uh, how militarization impacts on our ability to respond with have a humanitarian response to conflict and crisis. Um, the other two issues which I felt were completely absent and which I just asked both uh, speakers maybe just to engage with a little bit was um, firstly the issue of climate and obviously militaries are one of the biggest contributors to emissions in the world. I think we have the US military alone is estimated to be maybe um, in some estimates we'll put it at maybe the seventh largest emitter in the world if it was a country, um, let alone uh, uh, one department of a country. Um, so just the kind of urgent climate need to demilitarize and how this consistent narrative we have around participating in military alliances um, is there's an inevitable consequence of that, which is investment in weapons, investment in military exercises, which have an enormous climate cost um, and the kind of total cognitive dissonance required to not recognize the immediate obvious massive security threat that is climate change, that the, the massive migration impact of that at a global scale, the insecurity element of that at a global scale, and the role of militaries in relation to that. And the militaries that are engaging in climate change, to my mind, are militaries that are able to respond to climactic crises and, 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 and crises um, of migration, crises of a whole range of different things, due to climate breakdown. And that is what our military's role should be rather than in the weaponization which contributes to the, the climate breakdown in the first place. Um, <clears throat> so I guess just the climate element of it. And the other thing that was massively obviously missing from that forum was the element of gender. There was, we estimated, I think yourself and I and Asa estimated as about 80% men who were both speaking and in, in attendance at it. In the meantime, Ireland has a commitment to the UN resolution 1325, which says that women the role of women, and there is evidence and there is science behind it that says the participation of women in peace forums contributes as a, is a fundamental element which decides whether there is lasting peace or not, and whether peace processes work, and the sidelining of women, the sidelining of women from any discussions on security is not just a violation of the UN Resolution 1325, but it is fundamentally dangerous because women, there is a very gendered element to conflict and crises and military, militarization. Um, and I think Ireland has had a very important role to play in 1325. Our own example of the North is actually a very poor example of involvement of gender. Every single signatory of the, of the Good Friday Agreement is, is a man, um, but the role of women was fundamental to the getting, getting it to that point. Um, <clears throat> and I just, I feel again, we are, we are in a narrative where the real lived experiences of women in conflict is being completely negated from it in a in a very machismo narrative of the the rush to to arms and what what the role of sexual violence the role of elimination of women from democracy from community building structures from um participation in decision making is all been left behind in this discussion so sorry slight rant there but i might just hand back to the speakers and see if they want to comment on both of those topics that you are. uh okay so I don't know, Paul or John, who wants to uh, come in on that one? There's lots in that. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to jump in on some of it. Um, I'll try and remember all the points. I think on the uh, 1325, I think that that's a really important point. You know, having um, gender balance within any of these conversations is so crucial. I, I think also the fact that... that um, any decision that we make uh, will also impact significantly on future generations, probably means that we should also bring in the youth peace and security kind of uh, perspective on this and to have uh, voices of different generations. I think 
um, you know, that's something that's really uh, crucial to these kind of discussions. So I wholeheartedly agree with you around that. And um, maybe just to come onto a point that, that Kieran just briefly mentioned, which was around um, the kind of resolutions and, and the barriers to that. Well, there are alternatives within the UN system already to a UN Security Council mandate for peacekeeping. There's a Uniting for Peace resolution that, um, that we can do, and it is very challenging to get, but there's reasons that these are so challenging because of the significant um, effects. Um, in terms of uh, security and in terms of conflict. Um, I think on the issue of um, the environmental kind of components, um, you know, we see climate change as being one of the most challenging and cross-cutting issues in conflict in the regions that we work. We work on borderlands of Ethiopia and Mali, Ethiopia and, and Kenya, Mali and Burkina Faso and um, where conflict is driving real life conflict, it's displacing people um, and it's making um, the living conditions of people who are the most vulnerable in the world uh, unbearable. And uh, where we see conflict erupt, we also see the impact that it has on the environment. We've seen that in Syria and where we see large scale uh, role of military and um, ammunitions, for example, um, and the investment in military, we also see the significant impact that it has on the environment. And there's loads of research and statistics to support that. So I do think that that's a key part of the conversation that also has just um, not really been uh, there to see just yet. Um, I, I can come in there too and, and just uh, agree with um, practically everything that Janet has just said, but one thing I would highlight is the studies carried out by the Pentagon in relation to climate change. They know all about climate change. They know that it is a huge driver of um, conflict. Uh, I was asked to um, deliver a few lectures in a university in the United States, Notre Dame in 2011. And uh, one of them was on the question of conflict and, and the relationship uh, the relationship with uh, climate change. And I had to go into, in quite a bit of detail, what the Pentagon was looking at at that stage. And the, it, it was quite rigorous. They had done their research. They knew exactly what was, you know, what the consequences were. I suppose that's the real difficulty. Um, you know, we know that um, many of the, um, you know, fossil fuel companies and, you know, the higher echelons of the military know exactly what the consequences of climate change are going to be. I, I suppose they calculated uh, they, and they do calculate that they're going to be protected from the worst effects of it. But um, the fact is that uh, Greta Thunberg herself recently went over to Ukraine to talk about the consequences for um, CO2 emissions from the conflict over there. And um, I mean, a tank, a tank uh, is running on, um, the worst type of fossil fuel running for 70 kilometers, the emissions are going to be colossal. Um, that's a fact. Uh, but that's just one aspect, aspect of it. The fact is too that, though, that climate change, uh, because of its effects, um, is destabilizing. And uh, if you look at a terrible bloody conflict that we've seen in Syria, um, all the indications are that, is that it, it, it's one of its root causes was the bread shortages at the time, where a lot of the people who lived in the countryside went in and that caused a lot of disquiet. And then there were, that, that's what the disruption, it was caused by the shortage of food. And that's going to be exacerbated in the years to come. We know that, um, and we're going to get waves of migration. So what, what will the military do? Well, um, it all depends on how our voters uh, react. I would imagine that there will be, and I, I think it's going to happen in this country, we see ourselves as outliers, and Paul was talking about great tradition that we have here. We haven't had the rise of a right-wing party in this country yet. In fairness to Sinn Féin, they haven't played the race card. But um, that's not to say that, it's, it, that uh, we're going to remain immune. I don't think that we're exceptional. I think that we will get a right-wing party here eventually that will have around 20%. If you look across Europe, these parties are gaining all the time. The, the alternative for Germany, AfD, uh, has around 21% in the polls. Um, you see it in Italy, you see it in Spain. There's a, a Vox is going, to, is going to be very strong in this current election. The big issue is migration. 
Uh, and that migration is going to get a lot worse because of climate change. So um, these are the discussions that we should have uh, because uh, it's happening and it's happening at a rate that none of us could have foreseen. Okay, thank you, John. I'm going to go now to one of the ones in the chat and I'll come back to you then, Oliver. And I specifically want to ask this one. It's the first one that was there, but I think it's really good because um, it was something that came up in the forum a lot of the juxtaposition between funding the defense forces and neutrality. So the questions from John, um, should we maintain neutrality, but invest in our military capacity to defend ourselves or just become fully pacifist like Costa Rica? Well, look, um, I, I, I don't think that the, the, the option, the Costa Rican option is, um, is on the table at this stage. But um, I do think that we do, we do have to invest in, um, you know, the, the Navy, for example, protect our um, marine protected areas. Uh, we don't, they're, they're not adequately funded. We're not adequately funded to carry out our, 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 our UN missions even, right? And um, Paul was saying that we have a, a, a huge, you know, fantastic reputation. That's true. I, I've been in the Middle East and we are seen as honest brokers uh, because of, you know, tours of duty in Lebanon and elsewhere. What concerns me is that uh, because of our EU commitments, we're withdrawing now many of, um, you know, the, the troops that are engaged in UN peacekeeping and they be, they're becoming involved in EU missions. Um, now, this has a number of consequences. First of all, it damages our reputation because that's what our reputation is based on. Uh, but um, secondly, um, it is going to cost a lot more money. These EU missions are going to cost a lot more money, far more costly. So um, to answer the question directly, I do think we need to invest. I don't think we should become like Costa Rica. And, um, you know, I think our emphasis should be on UN peacekeeping going forward. Paul, do you want to come in on that one? Yeah, definitely. Um, I actually think that's a really key kind of part of this conversation. In my mind, um, two issues have really been conflated here, which is on one hand, the issue of Irish neutrality and the triple lock, and on a totally different hand is the issue of our military and expenditure. If we look around Europe, if we look at Austria, and I'm going to keep using the example of Austria because there's so many commonalities, they spend about 0.8% of their GDP on military investment and military expenditure um, while remaining neutral. And we spend about 0.3%, so significantly less than another country uh, that we could compare ourselves to on a number of different markers. Um, and I think that when we look at um, the presence of um, Irish peacekeepers and the key role that that has played in you know, transforming and maintaining peace in incredibly difficult circumstances. If you look at the reputation that's given Ireland globally and what that's done for Ireland, I think it's so key. And if you look historically within Ireland in 2010, we had a restructuring of the defense forces and no real additional investment. And so, yeah, there is a gap in that and that needs to be addressed, but that is a totally separate issue than Irish neutrality, which I think should be maintained while making sure that our military is appropriately um, invested in. Okay, thank you. Oliver. Uh, thanks, Nasa, and, and thanks, John, and, and Paul as well. Um, I, I think in some ways we, we, we've kind of segued into the questions that, that I want to ask. And anyway, um, like when Paul was speaking, you mentioned the, the voices that were at the consultative forum. Um, and me looking at it, I, what I see is a uh, hand selected panelists who are there to speak. Uh, not to listen and and to <laughs> what degree is that a, a consultative forum uh it, it, it's a panel discussion um so the first question I'd, I'd have uh is is what mandate do you think that that forum has uh in order to produce a report and where does it get that mandate from and and you know to what degree is it consultative uh to what degree is it emerging from it and to what degree it was it predefined from the outcome or from the beginning if you if you choose panelists to speak in a certain discussion it's not going to be very you know surprising if they speak in the thing you ask them to speak on um and just like paul and and john were saying there there are lots of things uh and janet mentioned this there's lots of things we can talk about when it comes to to defense policy like we have fisheries protections we have cyber security we, we have you know the, the role we see for ourselves in international humanitarian as humanitarianism we have the the pay for for uh, defense forces families we have the uh, the women of honor issue which was right there 
should have been hanging over the whole consultative forum, but wasn't wasn't there at all. Um, and we have you know sort of things that were touched on tonight about our what is our shared common understanding uh, of neutrality and our values for neutrality. And actually, look, we, we've had this position since since uh, the start of World War II, but it, it's an evolving one. Uh, it, it happened for historical reasons, and maybe we've never properly defined it and, and come to come to be comfortable with it. Um, and you know, a discussion around that, I think, would, would, would itself have value. So, what do you think would be a better approach? Um, and then Kieran mentioned this as well. And sorry to be so, so, throwing so many questions here, um, but Kieran mentioned that there are positive positives about her neutrality. Um, that we don't always hear, and there, it's not just the moral positives, but there's practical you know, positives, and, and Paul has mentioned some of these, right? there's practical political positives to being neutral, and there's, there's practical um, peacekeeping positives to, to being neutral, um, and I think we should speak about those more and understand that they're just as practical uh, as the people and arguments to say that we, we should you know, move away from, from things like the triple lock, so Sorry to throw so many questions, but mm. if you can, I'd, I'd like to hear some some things around that. Thank you. Okay, so we might start with the process, um, if, if that's okay from both of you, because personally, <laughs> I thought the process was pretty eye uh, um, eyebrow raising. So I, I don't know what you all thought, or John or, or, or Paul. Well, I mean, I, I thought, um, you know, I, I thought it was completely inadequate. We should have had a citizens assembly. Um, that's far more consultative and you get um, a greater insight into what people are thinking. That's if you want to find out what people are thinking. Um, I think that the purpose of this, I said it when I spoke, was for one reason and one reason only, that in the middle of this report, there will be a recommendation to get rid of the triple lock. Now, um, I may be wrong. I hope I'm wrong, but that's having served a long time as a, a representative and, and been in the doll and understanding how these things operate. That's my, that's my take on it. Um, Oliver, you mentioned the advantages of our neutrality. Well, look, fact is that our Department for Foreign Affairs, do you remember when we got on the Security Council? And there was that, it was during COVID, I think, and there was that famous picture of them popping the champagne up in Ivy House. Um, you know, um, it wasn't quite a Boris Johnson party, but, you know, they got into a little bit of trouble, I think, at the time. In any case, uh, the reason that we got on, one of the reasons, and we sold it, you know, said so we are a neutral country, you know, and we have a great reputation. That's, that's you know, that's what. So when it, when it comes down to it, uh, we play that card uh, and uh, we can play it because we do have a well-deserved reputation, uh, but it's down to. Uh, it's down to years and years of grinding it out on the ground. We're very well respected as honest brokers, particularly in the Middle East. You know, you go amongst the Palestinians, you know, or you go to Lebanon. I know there have been difficulties, but overall, we're very well respected. Uh, and so that is the dividend. And, um, you know, uh, I, I, I think it would be a terrible shame to throw that away. So uh, so easily, I, I think there will be huge resistance from uh, from the Irish people. But I, I do hope that when this recommendation comes out, if it does come out and then we go to legislation, that we have to be extra vigilant around that. Paul, did you want to come in? Yeah, um, uh, on the process, um, I do think it was disappointing and um, is probably the best, most diplomatic language. And, um, you know, I, I think it, it felt quite stage managed in many respects. And I didn't feel the plurality of voices that we would expect in a debate of this nature in Ireland. Uh, you know, if this was a referendum debate, it would have required, uh, you know, mandatory kind of balance. And it just didn't feel like that um, within this space. And I do think that it definitely conflated those issues that I mentioned before around neutrality versus um, the role of our military. Um, and I think there's probably a need for a citizens assembly to take place. I think the Thomas the statement that um, the kind of international security policy couldn't be delayed. Um, is maybe putting the cart before the horse a little bit on this occasion. And uh, we need to come back to that. 
Um, on the issue of our neutrality and what it means, I really do agree. I think that we need to have discussion as a country about what our neutrality means and looks like, because it has been kind of within the vagaries of our, of our kind of own kind of sense of it. And in terms of the kind of role and, and the benefits that our uh, neutrality has given us, well, like we've made massive investment in our kind of contributions internationally. For example, Ambassador Donahue to the UN negotiated the SDGs back in 2015, I think, but also like around disarmament. And, um, you know, Ireland's kind of role and is something that we really bigged up uh, a few years ago around disarmament helped uh, achieve the peace prize for the international campaign against uh, nuclear weapons and uh, forgive me if i got that name wrong but also in terms of even statements by like minister coveney for example and he talked about how during times of i'm reading a quote now actually um, in times of heightened tension do not preclude us from making progress quite the contrary increased security concerns remind us of the urgency of our work to preserve global peace and security and to reach consensus on our disarmament and non-proliferation. So there is and has always been really strong commitment of Ireland around issues like disarmament, around human rights and around development. And that's a real added value for us on a global stage. OK, um, I'm going to go now to one. I'm going to come back to you, Blohi, and I'm going to go to a question in the chat. But just I just want to add in there. I know we talked a little bit about gender, gender equality at that forum, but I personally was very uncomfortable as well in the room that uh, the, there was a lack of representation from people from countries who have actually been affected by some of this decision making by you know the impacts of, of war and certainly that seemed to be a voice that was very absent from the room um so sorry this is from Cormac um is the fact that if we lose our neutrality Ireland and its multiple high value sites including Intel Apple Pfizer and all our data centers will become targets um, and put Ireland at risk. So I might broaden that just for our speakers to say, you know, we have this moment now to discuss Irish neutrality. What do we think actually are Ireland's, um, you know, where's our weak point? Like, what are the security concerns that we are actually facing? I have to say, it does strike me that data centers are kind of, you know, if you want to get rid of everybody's um, communication networks, taking out a few data centers might not be the worst idea. And, and it does, you know, it, it does kind of play on my mind every so often. Things like our renewable energy sources um, and, and obviously all that big pharma. Um, what would you, what, like what, what strikes you as, as the things that we're going to be facing in the next few decades in terms of security risks that we have to manage as a neutral country if we're still neutral? Well, there's a very obvious one. Um... I'm, I'm not a military strategist, but I mean, if if um, if you were looking at Shannon Airport and you had all of these military airplanes landing there, surely to God, you would say to yourself, well, I have to take out that airport, you know, um, so that's that's one. Um, now, that developed because, in fact, um, of Afghanistan, they were they started to land there. And then we had the examples of extraordinary rendition. Um, but um, I'm not sure do we still have examples of that. I don't think we do, but they're still landing. And in fact, we know for, for a fact that the some of the cluster bombs which are going to Ukraine are going through Shannon. So, um, so that would be one. Uh, I think perhaps you're right, NASA, that um, we're, we're such a, a focal point for a lot of the data here that it might be something that, that they would take out. Um, but... Um, you know, that's, I, I, I kind of, it's one of those things that I don't really want to, I, I don't want to get into a situation where we're, you know, because the obvious thing then is, well, if, if we're going to be a target, we might as well join a military alliance to protect ourselves. Do you understand the, the logic behind that? That's where it's at. And that is what has happened in relation to Finland and Sweden. And then you're, you're, it's that element of fear that drags you down that particular road. Um, at the moment, why would uh, why would Russia want to attack us, right? Um, why would China want to attack us? Um, you know, it's 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 one of those things. Uh, there's no there's there's no reason, no strategic reason. But if we're seen to be part of that um, alliance on this side, then they might just say, "Wait, okay, we've got to take them out as well." Anyway, that's my as a as a very non-military person, that would be my perspective on it. Paul, do you want to come in on that or like 
well yeah maybe maybe on my side there's a few things that i'd mention i think um you know kieran mentioned around maritime and i think there are definitely initiatives that don't compromise our neutrality that we could engage with um, and cooperate with as we always have done as part of the partnership for peace as part of pesco and all of these initiatives that can help support that I think uh, issues around cyber, I mean, we have experienced a national cyber attack already in the last few years um, with the health service. And so, but I do think that the, it's also important to recognize that I think some of that sits with a different department and not with the military. I think it's with the Department of uh, Environment, Climate and Communications. Um, so, you know, there, there needs to be cooperation between those and, and the military, but I do think that we need to recognize that it's not necessarily the mandate of the military per se. Um, and then maybe just the last one is around, um, and I'm going to keep my peace building hat on, and I do think that it's around um, things like uh, the European Peace Facility, and I think that um, the lack of the kind of oversight of the EU Parliament around things like that means that weapons could be provided to groups and cause significant human rights violations, um, and I think that that's also a security risk to, to ourselves and um, to be complicit within that. Um, and yeah, that's something that needs to be addressed. Okay, thank you. Um, Blohin? Thanks, Nasa. Um, the, one of our principles in the Green Party is, we have seven principles. One of them says the need for world peace overrides national and commercial interests. And I think, you know, that's, uh, th that's a really important principle. And I think in Ireland, we've taken our neutrality for granted. Uh, we've never really educated the public about what it means and we turn a blind eye as John said and undermined it on many occasions when things that are undermining our neutrality like the landings in Shannon are, are ignored or somehow over it um, currently like Ireland's neutrality is military neutrality and currently that gives us makes us in an ideal position to be peace brokers to be mediators to be diplomats and provide other ways of support we all know war is futile and in the end, we know there will be peace brokerage here in between Ukraine and Russia. And the question I have is how long will this take? And is there anything we can do to expedite that? Because providing more arms, providing more you know, munitions, et cetera, et cetera, is only causing more people to die and extending the life of the war. Um, I also have the question about, like, I understand Ukraine is our neighbor, is our nearest neighbor, but all of a sudden neutrality becomes a big question when Putin in, invades Ukraine. Before, like, where are we? Like, there's no talk of neutrality um, or getting involved in the war in Palestine. Or like uh, just before Ukraine, there was a major, major outbreak in Ethiopia with ethnic cleansing, lots of people dying. It barely made the news. This is a proxy war. Again, that issue has not been discussed. Munitions companies, for example, UK or the USA is the biggest exporter of munitions. Russia is the second or was up to this, the second biggest exporter. And um, war is shown to generate economic uh, benefit for a small, a small number of people, but it is there. So I'm wondering if, the, if John and Paul would have any advice in how we can tackle this media messaging that's going out that's undermining our neutrality now and trying to make us reverse things because it's 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 disproportionate the amount of times our neutrality has been questioned and how it's been given as a bad idea and i think we've got to get in there and we've got to stop that now before we've done damage to ourselves for the interests of a very small few we should know ourselves from our war here in between northern ireland in northern ireland that Eventually, we have thousands of people dying, but eventually we're going to come to peace. But who's made the money in the meantime? Anyway, that was a bit of a rant as well as a question. But anyway, sorry. That's about okay, that. you're not the first to do a rant. John or Paul, I don't know who wants to come in. There's some good points in there. Yeah. I'll let Paul go first if he wants. Yeah, I think so. I think this is a really important point. And for me, um, the issue of neutrality is basically crossing the Rubicon. Um, there's this is a point of no return. If we breach our neutrality, there's no point um, when we'll say later on, oh, you know, we'll now remove ourselves from international military alliances. That's not going to happen. I think in terms of what we can do to challenge the narratives, I think the opinion polls, like the Irish Times has published opinion polls three consecutive years that looked at um, the issue of uh, neutrality and, and public support to that, that looked 
Um, and it had ranges from between the mid 50 percentile and mid 60 percentile in favor of neutrality. Um, but I do appreciate that a lot of the media rhetoric around this has changed um, since Ukraine. And I think that's really worrying. And I think that's kind of the impetus for having a something like a, um, a forum that brings together all of society to discuss this. Um, and what can be done, I think, you know, beyond the kind of um, military supports, I think, you know, the sanctions regimes can get stronger. And I think there's lots of other things to put pressure on Russia to make sure that they are willing to come to a negotiating table or to make sure that they will withdraw troops or to make sure that there are any number of things that they can do in order to avoid the impact on their people as a result of, um, of sanctions. And, you know, um, I think for Ireland, the support that we've given in terms of humanitarian support is something that has to continue, you know, um, and that requires a big investment and big ongoing investment to the people of Ukraine. Yeah, well, um, I would say, Blahin, that the example that you gave of Northern Ireland is um, very appropriate because you know, we had this bloody conflict here. Um, I mean, Kieran earlier on mentioned, imagine if, if, if troops landed in Dundalk. Well, I think there are many nationalists who would argue, well, the troops were in Belfast and Derry, you know, uh, and uh, there was this conflict. And then you had the hardliners in the North who were saying, we have to continue the fight against British imperialism. Um, whereas, and then you had quite a number of people down here who would say, well, the, it's, it's the provos are the, are the problem. Um, and all of these, you know, this, these simplistic approaches didn't work. The one person who kind of understood the complexity of the issue was someone like John Hume, who said, we're going to have to negotiate. We're going to have to talk to the likes of, um, you know, the provos. Um, we're going to have to sit down with the British. Um, the same thing in, 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 um, in Russia and Ukraine. It's a very complex issue. Uh, and um, I, I feel enormously sorry for those yeah, young men who are, who are dying. Um, you know, very often they're, 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 they're the um, less educated dying, you know, poorer people. It's always the same people very often who die in these conflicts. And it's going to go on and on. Um, so, yes, I would love to see this country being brave enough to go out and say, listen, we've got to broker a peace here. At the moment, it seems to me that the people that are leading the way on those negotiations are the African nations, uh, trying to, and even, even to some extent, Turkey. Uh, but I think a European nation, perhaps if we were brave enough, we and uh, Austria could get together and say, what can we do within the European Union? Instead of being cowed, and I know that feeling that Kieran was talking about, uh, I've, I've experienced it in relation to another matter, which is, in fact, believe it or not, uh, our uh, tax regime. Um, to be sitting in a room there talking about tax and say, oh, God, there's, a, there's an Irish man sitting in the corner there. Look at what they're doing in relation to tax. Um, and, you know, you have this feeling of being ganged up on, even though, you know, I wouldn't necessarily agree with that approach that, that we've adopted, especially when we had the double Irish. But in relation to the whole question of um, neutrality. Yes, I can, I can well understand. And I've spoken to Grace about this, that they're feeling in a minority and saying the rest are pretty gung-ho about the uh, situation in Ukraine. Particularly, I have to say, the Germans. The German Greens have been um, pushing the boat out on this issue and saying, oh, we need to arm the Ukrainians more. And indeed, when this is, you know, I, I, I looked recently at the uh, news coverage of um, Ukraine joining NATO, um, there are people in the in the German Greens who say let, let the you know let Ukraine join NATO now. Well, I, I don't know if some people have taken leave of their senses because if 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 that were the case, we'd have an out and out you know a major war in our hands involving NATO versus uh, versus Russia. Uh, so I think we need to tread carefully, um, and um, I I take the points that. Um, Blaine has been making. I agree with her. I agree with her. Uh, but uh, it's going to take some brave people in government. I don't know if, 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 uh, if they exist right now, but they need to speak out and say, you know, this conflict is a bloody stalemate. It's going to go on for years and years. And the fact of the matter is um, that we've had other conflicts. We've had Yemen. We've had uh, Syria. You mentioned Ethiopia. We've had all of these conflicts. And 
I don't know uh, the reason for this, but I, I don't remember us opening our doors to the refugees from Yemen or from um, Syria or from these um, many of these countries. We had a, a completely different approach. Uh, why was that? I don't know. You can only speculate. But um, uh, the fact is that uh, right now, this conflict is set to continue. I don't see any end in sight right now. And that's a tragedy. Thanks, John. Um, I see a question from Liz in the in the chat there around um, what money is put into peace education and how important do you think it is to have discussions around the importance of peace and neutrality in our schools? And I think that discussion that we just had has kind of um, touched on some of those issues of how important communicating that position around humanitarianism and, and peace is. I do know that there's a civic, social and political education module in secondary schools um, that, that does cover Ireland's neutrality. But I, I can double check what the funding is on that. I, I, I'm undertaking, Liz, to put in a PQ for you to, to find out what, what that is. Um, Tommy. Yes, sorry, yeah. Uh, just, I, I haven't got my camera on. I'm, I'm in Germany right now myself. But uh, just to say that um, I agree with a lot of what's been said. The when I was on the EGP committee, we we drew up the uh, what was then the Green Foreign Common and Security Policy with the help of the Finns. The Finns were very good in this, and I can understand the Finns. Uh, you know, more so than the the, Swi the Swedish wanting to join NATO is it because they see that the, the the invasion that happened under Stalin and part of their territory was taken. So now, but I do think a lot of these um, fears in, in some of the former Soviet republics in Latvia and Lithuania and uh, and certainly are misplaced because, and are misplaced because they're, they're genuine fears, there's no doubt about it, but, but they're misplaced because Putin has made a huge mistake. And uh, in 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 his calculation, as we all know, he wanted to, he would thought he would take over Ukraine in in a, in a week or less. Uh, so I do think um, with the whole this, there's a certain pressures coming on Greens now from uh, other sources, especially the U.S. to join NATO. Now we know it's been Fine Gael policy, and uh, so they don't have to worry too much about Fine Gael, but they do want to see who else they can pressurize into moving in this direction. And of course, Fianna Fáil, to a certain extent, are pressurized, but certainly the Greens. And it is easier, and I would like to ask John to address this, easier to pressurize a small party like us and throw a lot of money at that pressure uh, in order for us to change our policy. And I'm wondering, when I read that document, uh, I was quite shocked, like John, uh, uh, where it came from, and are there people promoting this on behalf of somebody else? So, um, and, and so our party would be very, very, uh, as a small party, would be very um, prone to that type of pressure. And, and uh, so I do. And I, when I when I was on the EGP committee, we did try to organise an alliance between the neutral states. Um, with Austria, with Finland and, and Sweden, and at that time it was six with Cyprus, Malta. Uh, now, I've spoken to our Austrian friends, and there's no way our, the Greens in Austria will move any way at, at all, even a little bit towards NATO. Uh, so I do, I do think there are pressures on them. The, as Blahina said, the massive profits of the arms industry uh, is, is part of this agenda. Um, if you didn't have... Um, a war. If you had, if everyone was in NATO, you wouldn't have an enemy, I suppose. And in fact, Malcolm Rifkin, former uh, foreign secretary in the UK under Thatcher, uh, suggested that the that the Russia should join NATO. If you look that up, you'll you'll see it's there. So I mean, th there is this rush to join NATO and to become a big arms industry and the two percent uh, spending, etc. Um, will, will come into place. So, and all of the green parties, uh, you should remember, come from a pacifist tradition. They come from that tradition, and it's still strong, even among the Germans, even though the foreign ministry is a bit gung-ho in support of the, the war efforts. The, the German Greens are split on this. The German Greens do not all agree with, 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 with their own uh, uh, party and government. So, but I do think um, we should be guarding against the, any form of uh, pressure that's coming, and we should be looking at where and who 
that 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 these um, pressures are coming from. Hmm. Thanks, Tommy. I, I, I think I'm just asking for a reaction, John, or, or well, well, look, I mean, I it, it just just strikes me now that you know the Greens are in government in Austria. We're in government here. Wouldn't it be very constructive if at least we got a dialogue going between both our parties and saying, God, listen, can we just explore the possibilities? You know, even, you know, even um, in a very tentative way, um, not going out in public at the beginning, just to say, what can we do as a Green Party, both of us as Green Party in government with a different approach, um, looking at diplomatic efforts to try and see, can we broker some sort of peace, you know, that's the, you know, that would be very, very constructive. On the question um, of, and Tommy has raised this, I mean, I, um, this, you know, who was involved in, in, in drawing up the policy in the very first place? Um, well, I mean, I was, uh, I didn't know anything about this policy. I know Liz Cullen is on the line. So Liz, um, Liz was involved in, uh, to some extent. I know she wasn't fully happy because I spoke to her subsequently about some of the decisions that were made, but I did, uh, it was sent to me a copy of the latest um, installment of uh, the Phoenix. Uh, now I've always been very skeptical about the Phoenix, have a, a healthy skepticism of what I read in the Phoenix, but uh, when I read it, it was quite interesting. You see these long list of interesting individuals who were involved. And um, so I rang Vincent, who has been very helpful, I have to say, Vincent P. Martin. And so I asked him, I said, Vincent, I can't believe what I'm reading here. Is, is, uh, is, could this be, could this be true? Like that all these people with um, extremely interesting CVs were involved in drawing up this policy. And uh, he confirmed that, yes, uh, there were quite a few of them involved who wouldn't share my point of view, uh, I have to say, uh, and probably wouldn't share the point of view of many people on this call. So, um, yeah, that surprised me. I have never met them. I don't know them. Um, I'm sure they're very decent, nice people, but um, they don't represent my approach to this issue. And I suspect they don't represent the people that are on this call, as I said. So it's important to come back. I do think perhaps just to bring you up to speed, uh, I did put a motion to our local group, Dublin Bay South. It was agreed. Our party leader was there when it was agreed, covering all the issues in relation to defence. And I'm hoping that it will come up at our party convention so that uh, it's very clear where the party stands on the issue of uh, the triple lock in relation to peace enforcement. Thank you. Okay, thank you, John. Uh, Paul, did you want to come in? Yeah, apologies, I got uh, removed from the group myself, uh, my computer did that. Um, so yeah, maybe just on, on the issue of the arms industry, um, I think that that's uh, an important point to come back to. Um, I do agree, you know, when you look at um, the EU as a whole, uh, all of the member states represent one of the most significant arms exporters in the world. And when you see rising, um, you know, military expenditure within the union and, um, and globally, I think that that really does demonstrate that the politics of fear uh, are reinforcing militarization and security. And that's a very separate agenda to um, the invasion of Ukraine, which naturally has caused, you know, the entire geopolitical landscape of Europe and the world to change as a result. But um, yeah, I, I, I do agree that the, the arms industry plays a really key part in this and um, will continue to drive that forward, um, unfortunately. And I think it's really important that leaders across Europe make a really strong commitment to um, try and regain some balance in terms of the investment that they make in humanitarian development and peace building work globally versus just securitized approaches to address the root causes as well as the drivers of conflict. Okay, thanks, Paul. Um, we are now at 2026. So, Alistair, I'm going to make you the last question, if that's okay. And um, I'm going to hand over to you. And when our panel is answering, I might ask them to kind of give a little sum up as well as they answer your question. So, Alistair, you're on mute. One second. Thanks. Uh, yeah. We, we were discussing a bit earlier, basically, what uh, was, you know, the very interesting discussion in general. Uh, opening up also the, the detail of, uh, of our stance and I, I strongly strongly agree we basically need to push back uh, from any attempt to put it in to put us into NATO um, but, but 
we there was a kind of a, a, a side discussion went into would we ever get attacked it's unlikely that russia would ever attack shannon etc despite what's happening we seem to forget that we have we essentially have been attacked um and we uh, are subject at uh uh, at, uh, on an ongoing case with the problem of uh, hybrid warfare and disinformation. Uh, and we, one of the challenges is that while it's unlikely that we would ever come to a shooting war with Russia between Russia and Europe because, because of the danger of an escalation, that we become a backdoor way of attacking Europe and causing the uh, dissent and chaos within Europe by attacking uh, the undersea cables and uh, cyber infrastructure and coming from organizations that basically, you know, we, we saw our universities and the, the health service being attacked by um, Russian criminals who definitely got the okay and then got that okay withdrawn by, by the Kremlin. Uh, so it'd be interesting to hear the panel discussions about what kind of methods we can use in such a in such a case, um, I I mean, uh, Alistair, I I simply don't have the expertise on uh, cyber warfare. I have to tell you um, to answer that question de definitively. Um, uh, the person within the party who has got the most expertise is in government, which is uh, the person is Oshin. Uh, and he, he has, um, I think, done a very, very good job. But um, yeah, I, it's, it's, it's so difficult. I mean, at the moment, as you say, uh, it would appear to be criminals, criminal uh, elements. Um, you're saying there that uh, they got the go ahead from the Kremlin. That could well be the case. Um, but um, I think, you know, we have to, it, it, it did seem to me that uh, when those attacks took place, that um, we hadn't invested in proper cyber, cyber security. Uh, and that has to be um, a number one priority, um, you know, not just in terms of uh, warfare, but also just to protect ourselves against criminals. Um, so that would be, um, that would be something I would suggest. Um, you've asked me to sum up uh, as well, uh, NASA. So I, I would simply sum up by saying, look, I think it's great that we're having this discussion here this evening. Uh, I hope that we can continue to have the discussion. I hope it can be discussed at the um, party convention. There are different views um, within the party. I accept that. Uh, but I do feel that, um, you know, when people begin to look at this uh, at this subject in detail they'll come to the conclusion that um, by getting rid of um, the necessity for a UN mandate uh, for for peace enforcement that would be a retrograde step uh, I think um, you know it would open the door I think at some stage at some future stage and we'll wait and see we, we look if um, I don't know when that report is going to come out but um, if the report recommends, as I think it will, that we uh, ditch, completely ditch the triple lock, then you'll know that that's exactly um, where that certain elements of the government that they want to go down that road. And as I said uh, earlier on, that's when we need to be at our most vigilant. So thank you. Thanks, John. Paul? Yeah, maybe just to jump in on Alistair's question. Um, actually, we've got some experience within Christian Aid of programming that we've done to tackle mis and disinformation online. Uh, we developed, beta tested and rolled out a, a natural language processing algorithm within Myanmar using the Burmese language that removed 20 or 30,000 pieces of hate speech online. Um, and it looked at gendered hate speech, it looked at misinformation and many different things and worked with uh, social media platforms in order to get that removed. Having social media monitors that would help improve uh, the intelligence of the AI and the tech uh, to be able to adapt and, and to, um, you know, detect uh, hate speech and misinformation in a much more uh, effective way. So there are lots of things to do if uh, NGO can do that. And um, then at a state level, there must be much more effective tools that are at, uh, available uh, with investment. Um, and I guess to sum up, um, you know, I think that this 
uh, is a really important conversation that we're having. I think that it means that we need to have a much more concrete discussion around what our neutrality is, where we're going with it, and uh, to define it uh, for the first time, because I think that's uh, really crucial. And I think um, we need to remember to focus on what we do well as Ireland and to champion you know, respect for international human rights and humanitarian law to address the root causes of conflict, inequality, abuses of power, and to continue to drive our agenda on disarmament um, that have really been pillars of our foreign policy and have uh, helped us punch way above our weight as a small state. Um, I think there's a need for a citizens' assembly on neutrality. I think that the, um, the forum was um, an important, but maybe ineffective tool um, to achieve uh, a discussion and a, and a frank and open discussion around this uh, within uh, Irish society and a citizens assembly would give us a much better gauge of where the Irish people are at and to have a more balanced debate around that. And I suppose um, I would also advocate for commitment to the policies that were agreed upon within the programme for government. Um, and to make sure that there is consistency to the Irish people around what our government is and stands for and um, to deliver on that mandate. Thank you so much, Paul. I think this has been the kind of free flowing, fascinating discussion that I was kind of hoping to get from the forum, but did not. Um, and I kind of hope that if we did get a citizens assembly on neutrality and peace, that this kind of conversation would be happening in households across the country before we decided anything, before we move away from a long held position that people at their dinner tables, people over coffee would be having these conversations in the same way that we did during repeal, uh, really kind of you know delving down into the complexity of it. Um, I'm going to finish up because I think it's been a brilliant session. What I would like to finish on is, is this, is that every, pretty much every week, or at least I like to think every day, but maybe every week, um, I'm constantly asking myself, because you know, if you're a public, public representative you're a servant of the people and I'm always wondering like how can I be of service how can you you know um contribute positively to the situation and I actually have come to the position that states should be doing that also you know how, how we're not the US we're not the UK we're not Ukraine and we're not Russia but in where we find ourselves as a small country relatively rich with huge kind of um you know, a good name for peace and humanitarianism. How can we contribute to this? What's our particular thing that we can contribute in service to the global conversation here that would be positive? And we don't all have to be on one side or the other. We don't all have to do the same thing to contribute positively. Um, so I'm hoping that that's where we can lead the discussion as Greens in government and as a party and like in our own, in our own little worlds around the country as well. So I'm going to finish I'd like to thank everybody for coming. I'd like to particularly thank Paul and John for like what was really a fascinating discussion and thanks to Just Transition Greens and Oliver for organising and Janet as per usual. Thanks everybody.